Welcome to Entry Point Faith, where every week we find fresh meaning in the world so you can find faith your way. This week's message is titled, Metamorphosis. Watching a child grow up is simply fascinating. Watching that child gain control of her body, find her fingers and toes, crawl, take steps, and then talk is a true miracle. Children seem to change every single day for the first few years of their lives. And then, although they continue to change, it slows down a bit after that. Their bodies change still, their faces, their teeth, their minds change. And we expect that. Once we are fully grown, our growth alters. We don't seem to change as rapidly or as much. Yet we are constantly changing. We are constantly evolving as we age. Now let's just pause for a moment and focus on ourselves. What were you doing five years ago? What was your life like? How would you describe yourself? How are you different right now than you were five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Oh, we were so different then. We were young and beautiful. But we have changed so much in so many ways. Not only have we changed physically, but our minds have changed drastically. Our world view has changed over time because of our life's experiences and because of the natural process of maturation. Some of what has changed us have been the trials and tribulations of our life journey. Many decades ago, in the mid-1970s, when I was in graduate school for the first time, fairly newly married, and in my 20s, I read a book called Passages, which was written by Gail Sheehy. Passages was the first book that I think I ever read that addressed human development in adults. I had read child development books, but I had never really considered that there are a number of things that impact adults at certain stages of our lives just like the landmarks that seem to occur for child development. The book Passages is subtitled Predictable Crises of Adult Life. While that might sound like a distressing book to read, it was actually filled with some valuable information that I used throughout my whole life, my development as an adult. The author examined the basic landmark challenges of each decade of our adult life. She informed us about the trying 20s, the safety of home left behind, the beginning adult life with possible partners in search of the perfect fit, the catch 20s when illusions are shaken and the reality that it's time to make or break or deepen our commitments. The forlorn 40s, those dangerous years when the dreams of youth demand reassessment, when we aren't sure of our identity any longer, but where great opportunity for self-discovery awaits us. In this first book, Sheehy stopped her analysis with the decade of the 50s, but continued on into the 80s when she wrote her New Passages book in 1995, where she de redefined the concept of aging. She labeled the 50s flaming. She called the 60s serene, and then she called the ages between 45 and 65 the age of mastery, and the years 65 to 85 and beyond the age of integrity. I bring all of this up because as we age and move through life, just like when we are younger, 
We all need to know that much of what we feel and experience in our life journey is universal. We all find comfort in knowing that we aren't the only ones that feel like this. And often when we go through the same struggles and challenges and we see someone else doing it, we don't feel so alone. I think that each one of us have had moments of clearly realizing the metamorphosis that has taken place along the way. How the experiences of our journey have altered us, have caused us to see the world and the people in it with different eyes. What was once so desperately important to us in one decade somehow slides off our radar when we leave that decade behind. And so let's halt right where we are for a moment. Whatever decade we are in, with whatever needs we have, with whatever regrets we might be feeling, and now battered and bruised from our life journey, let's take stock of where we are. Are we living the life we have wanted to live? Are we the person we longed to be? Or maybe we're even better off than we thought we could ever be. Today, I want to focus on some self-reflection. I want us to focus on the truth. There is a commonly uttered phrase in our culture that goes like this, the truth shall set you free. So what does that mean? Does it mean that if we tell the truth, if we admit the truth, then we won't be punished? Is it meant to be a phrase that's used when parents are trying to find out who broke the window? Or does it mean something else? In education and psychology, I think it means that once we realize the truth about something, our doubts are erased and then we feel free. We are free to move forward because we now know the truth about an event or an experience or a person. In the Bible, the verse is found in the book of John, who is writing about following the teachings of Jesus. The full verse goes like this. If you live according to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. In this instance, knowing the truth means knowing about love and grace and compassion and humility, the things that Jesus wants us to know about so that we will live well with others and, and we will be better at loving each other. I want us to consider the power of those six words in an additional way today. The truth shall set you free. What about the truth that lies within each one of us? The true person that we are. The gifts, the abilities, the passion, the commitment, the tastes that we have, the drives that we possess, the true colors that we are. A month ago, I saw this post on Facebook, and it inspired this service today. October is about trees revealing colors they've hidden all year. People have an October as well. Whenever we hear someone say, well, we finally saw her true colors, it's usually followed by something surprising or negative. Maybe she's been wearing a false mask of kindness or cooperation, and her true colors are that she is selfish, conniving, or hurtful. I'm talking about the tendency that we all have to hide our true colors more than in that way. I think we sometimes hide the beautiful attributes 
of our personalities more often than we realize in order to show what we think people want to see. The good, the bad, the imperfect, the silly, these are just some of the various colors that make up who we are. Your shade of silly might be different from my shade of silly. You may have a heavy dose of a talkative color. God knows I do. Your true self may paint with broad strokes of compassion. Maybe your color is the color of love. There's more likely a tint of worry or fear in there too. And we all have our own shade of imperfection. That is a normal part of every human being's color kit. I think we hide our true colors, our true selves, because we are afraid to be ourselves. We put on a mask and, and we behave in ways that we think people want us to. We want to be liked desperately. So we do things that cause others to approve of us, even if that isn't the way we really are. Perhaps also, we may not really know ourselves very well just yet. We haven't really figured out who we are, what we believe, and, and how we want to live. So, of course, our colors are hidden from view. In order to live authentically, to display our true colors, we need to live our values, and we need to know ourselves. When we know and understand our weaknesses and our strengths, it is easier to let our true colors shine through. In the end, these colors make us who we are. And we can consciously choose which colors to reveal to whom and what beautiful work of art of ourselves we show to each person we meet. We have vulnerable, soft, watery colors. We have excited, passionate colors. Our shades evolve and the layers shift and change. When Marcy's mother lived with us, she was fond of saying the phrase, live the life you've always wanted. Whenever either Marcy or I had a shift in our journey, a job change or a circumstance change, she would always say, well, now you can live the life you've always wanted. One of the best ways to live is to figure out exactly how we are unique. What do we offer to the world that no one else can offer? There is no one else like you. There's no one else like me. And that is exciting. Are we living our truth today? Are we living a life of integrity? Have we hidden our true beautiful colors for far too long? As American poet Mary Oliver has written, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. As you know, Entry Point Faith relies on your financial contributions to keep everything going. If you would like to donate, please head on over to the website at entrypointchurch.org and you can click on the donate button. We meet every week at Connor Prairie in Fishers, Indiana at 1030 a.m. Plan to arrive a little bit early so that you can become a part of the community. Please join us next week when our message will be, listen up.